With Brady Quinn and Pete Prisco, I'm Chris Hassel. We are previewing every game in Week 15. Three teams have already clinched playoff berths. Three more teams are in with a win this weekend. The Ravens, Chiefs, and Saints already in the playoffs. Pats, Bills, and Niners in with a win. Packers can clinch with a win and a Rams loss. The Seahawks can clinch with a win and a Rams or Vikings loss. And there are also some division clinching scenarios as well, like the Ravens, who have already clinched a playoff berth. They could clinch the AFC North with a win, and with a, a win and a bunch of help, they could also clinch home field advantage throughout the AFC postseason this weekend. They begin on Thursday night against the 5-8 and eight Jets. They have a two-game cushion for home field with three to play, guys. And, and look, I think the only concern you have at this point moving forward is Lamar Jackson, who's questionable for the game, but he said he's going to play. Uh, we don't have probable anymore, so that would probably be the injury category he'd fall underneath at this point. But either way, you do have to question, like, is it worth it? It's a bad Jets team. I actually think they could probably win at home versus this Jets team in a short week, even if he doesn't play. Who's the back up there now? I don't even remember. It could be RG3. It could be Trace McSorley. Either way, I, it, would be, it would be RG3. Or RG3 most likely. But either way, I still think they could get by if he wasn't 100%. <clears throat> to me, I just worry about the risk, knowing the wear and tear that he's taken over the course of the year. If you put him out there, subject to do potentially an injury, how would that impact um, you know their ability to be able to win out after that? Because Cleveland will be a tougher test. They beat him the first time around. They have to go to Cleveland to play them. Then they play Pittsburgh, which defensively, that's one of the best teams they're going to go up against. And it's not like this Jets defense is bad. I mean, they're number one yards per attempt against the rush, second as far as against the rushing attack. So this will be a tough challenge. And I almost want to ask you this. Do you worry about Greg Williams' history of trying to take quarterbacks out of games? Well, I mean, first play of the game, they'll probably hit him in his quad. I mean, <laughs> that's his history. That's what Greg Williams has done. It's a legal hit. Yeah, it's that's a legal what Greg hit. Williams has done over the years. Look, in the last couple of weeks, he's taken a lot of shots. And I love it, the fact that they quickly come out, oh, this one was inside the pocket. Don't worry about it. He can take the shot. But he's taking a lot of shots inside and outside the pocket lately. And, and he's not a big guy from a physical stature, and, and that's concerning. And when he's limited in terms of his ability to run, that'll be something to watch here. Brady, we've always saw him in this offense with him as the threat to get outside. What happens if that threat isn't there in this game? Now we're going to find out if he can't run the way he normally runs, what he can do more from a conventional pocket. To me, it's all about Greg Roman and how he can use some smoke and mirrors to work out around Lamar Jackson and not necessarily have to make him the focal point, but make the Jets' defense feel like he's the focal point. So he doesn't have to necessarily keep the football a ton. You can have action that looks like it's going to be a zone read, and really you're just telling Lamar, hand the football off. You can utilize things off of the boot game and some of the RPO game to allow him to have some easy completions off of that. So it doesn't have to all center around him. Yes, he has to do his part and execute, but you're not putting him necessarily or subjecting him to some of those hits. If I'm playing him, normal game, and this isn't a normal game depending on what he can do, make him hand it off and make him throw it to the wide receivers. He doesn't throw it to the wide receivers, and I'll take my chances with the handoff rather than getting him outside and running crazy on me. Well, and I think teams have tried to do that at times, but, you know, but again. The, like the other day, they the, left the tight end wide open on a busted coverage, and, and he hit it for 60 yards. Because it's easier said than done. I mean, you, you do have to understand a lot of these defensive players are out there. I mean, they are focused in on what their assignment is. When you're talking about option football, I get it. that's the only thing you're looking at. And so if that's your man and you're reading run, and all of a sudden he comes off of you to then release downfield, your eyes are in the backfield, it only takes you a couple steps behind to allow that guy to look like he's wide open. The line's 14 and a hook. Uh, short week, though, that's, that's a, that's I a like, big I, line for me. I agree. I like the Jets in this game with the points. I, I think they'll hang around. And, and I'm going to your theory on Greg Williams. He's going to hit him and hit him hard early in that game to kind of set a tone. Earl Thomas said it this week. He said he feels like teams are trying to go after Lamar Jackson. But, again, they're subjecting him to that. So it's perfectly legal, or at least the hits that we're seeing right now. Uh, but I'm, I'm with Pete. I actually think the Jets can keep this one closed. Short week. Too many questions about Lamar Jackson's health and what that will look like in this game. I think the Jets' defense is better than people want to give him credit. So. And Le'Veon Bell all better, too, right? He's, the flu is gone. Well, well, and, bowling. Bowling. And, 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 and he bowled a 251, the weekend. which yeah, is pretty, good. pretty he impressive. Might, he might miss the game and go bowling. Who knows? <laughs> <laughs> all right, that game is uh, Thursday night football, Jets and Ravens. Moving on to Sunday's games, a 1 p.m. Eastern time kick on CBS. This is the one that... Uh, you know, we'll be focused on Jim Nance and Tony Romo are going to be there. It's a battle for first place in the AFC South between the Red Hot Titans and the, the Houston Texans, who are all over the map. 
since Ryan Tannehill's taken over, they're undefeated at home. And, and I have a hard time imagining, because they, they play their best football at home, that Houston's going to go in there and find a way of winning this game. Uh, Tannehill's been phenomenal. He's really opened up things in the passing game. A.J. Brown has been such a delight this year, helping to open things up for everyone else, too. But th- this is where I'm at with this Houston Texans team, Pete. Where? J- just when you want to count them out, Something tells me they're going to end up surprising us all with a performance and they end up finding a way of winning in Tennessee this week. I don't know. They made Drew Locke look like John Elway. I know. Yeah, look, yeah. their rush defense has been poor. Even their, their secondary has given up big plays. This sets up for the Tennessee Titans to win this, grab a hold of that AFC South division. I'm just saying something tells me the way the Texans have played this year where they look awful one week and then they could win a Super Bowl the next. Last week they were down. Maybe this week they're up. They were awful last week. Uh, that defense was pathetic. And, and Drew Locke, I'm going to give him all the credit in the world. He, he did a great job. He right. spun the ball. He was fantastic. He took shots. But that defense was really bad. And now you're going against the hot quarterback in Ryan Tannehill. Who's the better quarterback right now in this game, Tannehill or Watson? Depends on the week. I mean, you say Tannehill has been definitely more consistent. And so you give him the edge. But as far as overall ability, if Sean Watson, better. Ha- he's better. and if he- He's a better player. But Bring your quarterback skills out for this one, then. Oh, it's Watson. But, but Tannehill's playing better than him right now, and uh, it'll be interesting. The biggest turnaround for the Titans has been the improvement of the offensive line. Early in the season, it was terrible. They were getting beat all over the place. They had injuries on the front. You know, Lawan wasn't there. Now they've come together to play much better. I think that's going to be the difference in the game. They're going to pound it with, with uh, Derrick Henry and then throw over the top. So you think it's their offensive line. I actually think it's their running game. Since Ryan Tannehill has taken over, we know about the passing game. You know who else has benefited off of it? Derrick Henry. He actually averages a yard better per carry when he's back behind the quarterback under center compared to in shotgun. And Ryan Tannehill is much more comfortable being under, under center or being in shotgun either way. But that's way. the line too, though, Brady. It has something to do with the line, but I'm just saying it's also benefited having Ryan Tannehill in there yes. to be under center so he gets better angles too in his rushing attack. I think that's made the offensive line play better, at least in the run blocking too, with how it's impacted Derrick Henry. Um, but you know, this, this entire offense has gone through a transition with Ryan Tannehill. It's all been for the good. I just wonder how this matchup will be. Like, where, I'm, where you're I'm, wondering, I'm, who I'm are not, you picking? I'm not going to pick against the Tennessee Titans at home. I'll lay the three points. But this is like last week when I told you the Denver Broncos could go into Houston and you find a way to win that one. You didn't pick them to win. You said them. they would cover. I did say they'd cover. You didn't pick them to win. But on Sunday I, when you were texting, texting me, you were taking I'm not credit. Text, uh, taking the Texans. Or you were, he's texting me on Sunday. Look, I got the Broncos. <laughs> I, you didn't pick them to win. You picked them to cover. I didn't pick them to cover. Did they cover? Yes. They well, did t- cover. Titans are winning and they're covering. And these two teams play again. Right. And then they may play again. In the playoffs. They, the could, two, play, they could be the, the playoff. They play this week, and then they play week 17. They then each they have play a, the next a sandwich week. game, they could play as the next Pete week. would call yeah, it. Pete. Uh, the yeah, Texans sandwich game is at the Bucks. That's what most people call it. And the Titans sandwich game is against the Saints at home. We Which one of those? calling it a sandwich game? Well, that's no, 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 I like that. what Pete calls that's it. That's mine. I took it. The old Embrace sandwich it. game. Enjoy uh, it. That game, again, 1 o'clock Eastern time on CBS for first place in the AFC South. Also at 1 on CBS, those aforementioned Denver Broncos – and Drew Locke, two and zero as the starting quarterback, looks great going on the road to the nine and four Chiefs. Their defense has really picked it up the last three weeks. They have. Their secondary has been better. Their pass rush has been better. I talked to Vic Fangio earlier this week. He said one of the, the biggest things he was excited about for Drew Locke is just kind of the schedule worked out, where you got to start at home first, then go on the road. This, to me, though, is is, is going to be a tough test because not only is it the defense for Kansas City has to deal with, it's also going to be have to be keeping up with that Kansas City offense. Now, the question really becomes. How potent will that Kansas City offense be? And I do think Drew Locke will be able to find Cortland Sutton for some big plays and make some plays in this game. But nine and a half points, it's pretty big for a divisional game, especially the Broncos in playing. But I think they, I feel pretty confident the Kansas City Chiefs now starting to get on a roll. And it's tough to go into Arrowhead and play. When you're a quarterback, you know. It can be brutal on quarterbacks. This is going to be a real challenge for them. I think the Broncos may have found their quarterback. I, I love what I saw from him last week. He's a cocky kid. He's a confident kid. He's got the big arm. He will make the throws. They may have found their guy, but this is a bad spot for him. That Chiefs defense is playing much better, and it's easy to look at it and say, okay, Chris Jones is healthy. That really helps. But I think Thornhill on the back end is playing much better now than he was early in the season. Honey Badger's playing better than he was early in the season. They are getting better and better on that side of the ball. I think that shows up here. I think they cover the nine and a half and win this game pretty easily. Talked to Tyron Matthew earlier this week, and one of the things he talked about was just how early on they were still trying to kind of find themselves within Steve Spagnuolo's scheme. Now they really feel much more confident in what they're being asked to do, utilizing their, their fundamentals and techniques that they're teaching 
and apply, and I think that's what we've seen as far as the big strides from Kansas City so far. Uh, they have not allowed more than 17 points in any of their last three games. They're one game behind the Patriots for a bye in the AFC. Do you think they eventually get that bye? Uh, I, don't, I don't foresee the, the Patriots falling off. I, I really don't. I don't think they're going to end up catching up with them. Okay. I don't either. But you both like Kansas City to cover the 9.5? Absolutely. Nine and a half. Absolutely. Okay. Moving on to Cincinnati. The Bengals hosting the Patriots, 1 o'clock Eastern on CBS. This game a little bit more interesting because of the whole, you know, Spygate Part 2 thing. And I don't think it's going to play any impact whatsoever on this game. I think this is actually kind of a bad matchup for the Patriots, at least up front. When you look at their offensive line, some of their struggles, and the fact that you're going up against Geno Atkins, you're going up against Carlos Dunlap, there's an opportunity that this game could be closer than the 8.5 points think for Cincinnati being a home dog. So uh, I'll be curious to see how much offensive production the Patriots can come up with. Uh, I think when you look at it from a scheme perspective, Josh McDaniels should have a heyday with the Cincinnati defense. But something tells me there's some issues with, with the personnel and the matchups that they've got, especially up front. Is this going to be the 10th straight week, Pete says, the Patriots offense finally breaks out? Uh, I don't know if it's capable of breaking out right now. You've They're, given up? No, I'm not giving up. I, I, Just like you gave up on your Jaguars, look, you've given the, up on the The Patriots Bengals offense. are a perfect tonic if you're going to fix that offense. This is the defense I think at times you can make some plays against them down the field. Uh, as far as the videotaping of signals, mm -hmm. I could send my cousin over there and he could sit there and videotape signals with his phone just as well as anybody can with a, with a camera. So I, I think that the whole thing is getting blown way out of proportion. But, but, but isn't it about the intent? Like, if there was the intent to cheat, you've done it before, like, isn't, it, isn't there something about that where, why you, first off, why do you need to do it versus Cincinnati? And, and why are you doing it in general after you've already gotten caught for this? I, I don't know if the guy was acting in a rogue situation. Maybe he did it himself, but... Brady, if I wanted to film somebody's signal, sure. I could go get a you could sit, buy a fifth row, sit the sit stands and, and film them sure. all, and it's not an issue. So I don't think this is the case. Have they done something illegally probably in the past? Yeah, they have, and they've been caught. This one, I think, has been blown away out of proportion. Signals in college, you see a lot of times now. They've all got the time, they shield them. And look, people say, well, everyone's got the, the coach, the quarterback, or they have the green dot in the back helmet, so everything's more through, the, through, through whether it's defense or offense through the communication, but there still are a lot of signals that are involved from time to time. It could be personnel groups. It could be a bunch of different things. So, again, it's more about the intent of this. If the New England Patriots were, again, trying to cheat in some fashion or form, it's just getting to the bottom of what exactly they were able to glean from that and then punishing them so we don't see this from them again. Look, if they want to buy a ticket and go to a game and do it, it's going to be hard for the NFL to stop them from doing right. that. But the problem is that's not what they did. They went in and got credentialed into a way stadium to go Which ahead and makes, do that. Which makes the whole thing that much uh, a, a problem for me because I don't think they would do that. You're not going to be that obvious to go do that. I don't think you're going to do it. If you're going to be sneaky about it, you do it by Maybe sitting hiding in plain sight, Pete. Yeah, I don't know. If I see somebody down there on that Patriot sideline banging on a trash can like we see in the Houston Astros dugout, then, then we'll be asking I thought it was the whistle. Well, I thought it was the yeah, whistle. They got a little bit of everything. Off the pitches. Uh, you're not cheating. You're not trying. That's the way I believe it. The line's nine and a half. You guys think that the, the Patriots yes. will cover that? Yes, I do. Okay. I do too. The 10 and 3 Seahawks at the 5 and 8 Panthers. Seahawks did not score an offensive touchdown last game for the first time since the first week of 2017. They look bad, uh, and bottom line is they can't feel good coming off that. A West Coast team coming to the East Coast to play the Panthers, but uh, a team who's looked worse has been the Panthers, and, I, and teams are running all over them. This is just a bad matchup when you look at these two teams and what Seattle likes to do on offense and really what Carolina struggle with is you know, giving up too much production on the ground. So I suspect Seattle's going to go on the road, run the football, kind of have their way with that Carolina Panthers defense. And this is a spot, too, where I think the Seattle Seahawks defense can start to get in a little bit of a roll because they've been kind of quiet in particular last week. Didn't really do much to stop the Rams. Yeah, that was the end of the Russell Wilson MVP talk. That's, right. That's finished now. Really the last three weeks. Yeah, they haven't played close. very well. And, and as an offense, they got to pick it up. And I think they will. You mentioned it. Carolina's run defense is awful. Chris Carson will run wild in this game. They will control the clock. Uh, and I don't think that on the other side of the ball you're going to see much activity in terms of other than Christian McCaffrey. Uh, again, I go back to Kyle Allen. They're talking. Of, there's some people up there that are pushing to maybe get Will Greer in there and let, get him some playing time because I don't think Kyle Allen's played that well lately. It makes sense. He's a third-round pick. you got to see what you have in him before you move forward. You know, Christian McCaffrey, the last three games, though, held under 80 yards rushing each of those, you know, those matches. He really hasn't been able to give uh, Kyle Allen much help. So, that, that's, that's really, I think, what Seattle's game plan is all about. Load up the box, stop the run, stop Christian McCaffrey, 
and you stop this Carolina Panthers. This is offense. a long trip for Seattle, like you mentioned, but they've traditionally played well on the they East have. Coast with Russell Wilson. But, so. Pete, but Pete, it's it's the second of a back-to-back -back road game. Tough. You always talk about. They didn't really show up in the first That's one. That's true. So does that so make a difference? I mean, would, yeah. would you pick it differently had they won that first road game? Maybe. No, this Carolina team can't stop the run. They're awful against the run. I think Chris Carson is going to run for about buck thirty. Uh, they're going to control the clock, and, and Wilson will make some plays. A couple things. I think a lot of teams are trying to get the three wide receiver sets in the game to force Carolina to go to more of their, their four-down personnel. So those smaller edge rushers, guys like Brian Burns uh, coming off of the edge, they're lighter. Teams are having success doing that running against them. They also miss Thomas Davis. I mean, people kind of tend to forget he's moved on from this team. And Keekly hasn't missed. played as well this year. No, he hasn't. Uh, you know, Shaq Thompson got the extension recently, right. but, but he's, that, that group hasn't played quite as well. But, again, I, I think it's in part because they wanted to improve their pass rush, so they got lighter and faster off the edge. However, they sacrificed, I think, some of that mass on the interior, and you're seeing the results of that. I agree. Now. Seattle covering the 6.5? Yes. Yeah, I think okay. they do. Moving on to the six and seven Bucks at the three nine and one Lions. Both these teams eliminated from postseason contention. The Bucks playing much better football of late, and Jameis Winston says he's going to play despite the broken thumb. Yeah, and I think you can throw it all over this Detroit Lions defense. Um, one, they're going to be indoors, so you know the weather's not going to be a factor. And he's been putting up some production. You know, even though it's, it's coming with a few interceptions here and there, he still is slinging the football all around the field. So this is a good spot for Jameis. I think they go on the road, they get a win. You know, David Blau's not going to have much help. This Bucks defensive front, they've been really good against the defense. So if Blau and the Lions want to stay in this game, they're going to have to go toe-for-toe -toe with Jameis Winston and chucking it all around the field. That uh, graphic we just showed from Jameis Winston from a week ago, is that not vintage Pete Briscoe kind of game? Four, yes, four that's 50. exactly what you want out of Jameis Winston. 454. I'd take a two instead of three, though. One of those was a pick six. Just make it a yeah, regular interception. You'd love interception. to have a, a two to one touchdown interception ratio. Like, we get that, but unfortunately, that really hasn't been how no, it's played. No, but this year. 450 and four and two would be a heck of a game. I'd take that every single week, and so the, would you, Brady. The irony is at this point in time in Jameis Winston's career, and there was a stat that we put out on our social media feed comparing Jameis Winston at this age Peyton. and Peyton Manning. Yeah. And they're almost identical they at this point in the season. It's just it's funny that, you know, for as much flack as Jameis Winston gets, we forget, you know, a couple of decades ago, that was very similar to where Peyton Manning was. 20, through time. 23 interceptions. But what but about wins, is. though? I mean, Peyton was no, much he, more they, successful. But, but as he always says, you can't, you can't contribute that directly to wins because it's all about the team out around them. Tell, we talked about this earlier in the week. What quarterback was dealt a, a worse roster around him than Jameis Winston? He was drafted number one overall. Not a good football team. So he's had to overcome a lot, I think. Yeah, but you also got to go look at that stats. And this is great. I love the way they compared the two because it was, what, 26 and 23 for Peyton? And then he started going 11, 10, 9, Yeah, 10. he made a drastic right. improvement. Well, that's what that. he has to do. He has to cut down the interceptions. Well, this, uh, this year's been an outlier. He hasn't been this bad in no, the past as far as no. the interceptions. And, and New I, system. Think, I think he's coming back. I think in Bruce Arians' system, the second year, usually better if you look, go back and look at the history. Uh, and he's going to light up the Lions this week, even without Mike Evans on the field. Yeah. Bruce Arians says they have the nicest team in the league because Jameis Winston himself has given opponents 61 points off turnovers. Well, yeah, everyone gets to have a, a part in all of it, right? <laughs> His team scores. Yeah, the other team's getting the team. football. It's a fun game. Makes for a fun, fun game. game to watch. Makes for fun it's game. It's gonna be a fun game to watch. You guys both like Tampa Bay minus yes, three and I do. a half. Yes. Okay. Moving on to the seven and six Bears at the ten and three Packers. Green Bay a one game lead over the Vikings in the division. The Bears basically eliminated, even though they can get to ten and six. Sportsline giving them about a three percent chance to make the postseason. This, this is the nail in the coffin. I think this is to the, the end of that run for Mitch Trubisky. He's played good the past few weeks. I think I think the buck stops here. What was it? Lions, Lions, and Giants. I mean, yeah, come and, on, you got to right. temper a little. And you're going against the defense that, unless they can run the football and really not put them in tough situations, I don't foresee them having a heyday versus these edge rushes for Green Bay and that secondary uh, in Lambeau. And especially considering, I think if, if Aaron Rodgers needs to, you know, he's always got the trump card in his back pocket. He can co come out and put up a bunch of points, but. This is a different Packers team, Pete. They're running the football. They're playing good defense. They haven't necessarily had to resort to him chucking it all around the field. No, eventually they're going to have to, though. In this game for the Bears, I think they're going to run Montgomery. You mentioned it. The Packers have had trouble because they're not a big defense stopping the run. If you want to try and, and win the game, you have to run the football here. I don't think they're going to be able to do it consistently and well enough. They haven't done it all year. And on the other side, you're right. It's been Aaron Jones running the ball. They didn't have to put up big numbers last week against Washington. He did, I, though. Yeah, but in this game, I think he might light them up. I think this is one of those games where they got to get it going offensively and look like a good passing team. They haven't looked like a great – look at those numbers, 23-2. and two. Those are outstanding from a, a you know, TD to interception ratio. 
that should be more like 35 and, and 7. Let's be honest, though. Outside of Devontae Adams, who in this yeah. wide receiver group, though, are you saying that is really a solid number two? Never without Adams. No. And, and Valdez Scantling has been a major flop for them. I thought he and, and Aaron Rodgers thought he was going to be good. We talked about it in the preseason. He hasn't done enough. Uh, yeah, you're right. They haven't had enough from those receivers. Well, that, that plays a factor into it. But I, I'm with you. I, I think this could be a game where maybe they start to build some of that momentum. Uh, and that's, that's the scary thing for a team that's what ten and three. I mean, they really haven't hit their stride yet. They've been winning football games, and they really haven't played their best football. I think that's scary as you get ready to approach the playoffs. What if it does start to click? This could be a scary team. Vikings coming up, right? Isn't that uh, next week? Is that in prime time? Uh, I oh, it. Kirk Cousins. Yeah, you like that. Prime <laughs> time. He, was good. he lost the last one in prime time. The Mitch Trubisky chatter has calmed down a little bit. In well, terms of, of of ripping them, yes, like you you Bears fans. Bears do? fans. I mean, there's some of them that have that have come around and said, okay, you know, maybe give him another year. Here. You'd be a good person to talk to about this because you know you were around Jacksonville often when Blake Bortles was there, and this reminds me of like a three game stretch where Blake Bortles. I want to say it was back in. 17. 2017. No, uh, yeah, 17. He had, 2017, he had a three-game stretch. Three, he was, early December, he right. was phenomenal. One of those games was against Seattle. And, and that's where I feel like you can kind of get fooled a little bit. Yep. And, and that's where they are. It's a small sample size, but he looks great, and he's convincing people that you know, maybe he's more than that. Again, I think it ends here, but you were around that. Do you yeah. think the Chicago Bears will fall victim to the same thing? Yeah, you got to be careful with that. And, and you know, like he's got a fifth-year option. They can exercise it, and they will. Um, but you got to be careful to get too caught up in three games. And is, you're, per, you're right. That's a perfect example. And against example. bad competition, like you said originally, Pete. Packers minus four and a half. Is the oh, yeah, I'll lay the point. Oh, yeah, okay. absolutely. Six and seven Eagles are now tied for first place. They are at the three and ten Redskins. Another 1 p.m. Eastern time kick on Sunday. Eagles tied with the Cowboys, and they play in week 16. Well, obviously a huge game for the Eagles because they want to try to get that NFC top in it, or win the NFC. It's the only chance they – or NFC East. the only chance they have of getting the playoffs. This could be that game, though, for Dwayne Haskins where we finally see it. We finally see him come up, take advantage of a secondary that's just been awful this year for the Eagles. Terry McLaurin, some of the other pieces that they have there. This could be that game where we finally say, there it is. There's the performance that we've been looking for all year from him. You, you know that Washington wants to run the football, but good luck versus that front. I'm telling you, I think this could be that game for Dwayne Haskins. Mm, I don't. I, I think the, you're right. The Eagles secondary has had their moments in the last couple weeks where they've been terrible, particularly the corners. Mills against Miami last week. It was both Darby and Mills. Uh, but I think this is a good spot for the Eagles. There's so much. We and keep it, saying that. We thought last week was a good so spot. But they're so banged up, Brady. I, I, look at the offense. Uh, you, you know, no Jeffrey. He's not going to be there. You don't know if Aguilar is going to well, be there. Well, now you're making excuses no. for him, so you're only making my case. I'm going to the other side of the ball, the defense. The defense is healthy. And, and I think part of the problem is defensively, they're a wide nine, right? That's what they want to do is come up the field. And I don't think they're getting home enough. And so those corners are getting exposed. But this is a game where you look at Haskins. He holds the ball. And when he holds the ball, they're going to get home. The pressure's going to get after him. I think the, they're going to be sitting there watching that film from the New York Giants and watching how fast the ball came out of Eli Manning's hands. But Haskins holds the ball. It, it doesn't matter. For each week, you're going to see growth out of him. I promise you. This is going to be that game for him. You're this taking the Redskins? No, I'm not going to take the Redskins. <laughs> I'm going to take the Eagles, and I'm going to lay the points. But I'm telling you, Dwayne Haskins is going to have his best game of the season versus the secondary. Yeah, I, I don't think I don't see it coming. Unless unless there's just terrible weather. I think, they're going, going to pressure, I think they're going to pressure him and hit him, and uh, I think he's going to hold the ball, and it's just, just going to be, be ugly. Be careful of scary Terry. Remember I'm this, telling you right now. The Cowboys win next week at Philly and win in the final week. They win the division, period. End of story. That's a big issue. the same week. about the Eagles, though. If the Eagles beat the Cowboys and then win Not the last game. Not if they lost game, this one, though. <laughs> could come down to uh, tie-breaking scenarios again if they, uh, if they end up splitting during the regular season. Right now, the Cowboys have that tiebreaker because they have that head-to-head -head dominating win over the Eagles earlier this season. Okay, 1 o'clock Eastern on CBS, the 3-10 and 10 Dolphins, and the 2-11 and 11 Giants. Got two OGs at the quarterback position, Ryan Fitzpatrick against Eli Manning. Yeah, and this is the toughest game, in my opinion, to pick all week. Because I think that the Dolphins have been playing better football. Uh, they're obviously the better team just if you look at their record. But something tells me Ryan Fitzpatrick going in there to New York, there, there, there could be a, a number of interceptions thrown the Giants' way. And, and maybe if Eli gets another start here, he takes advantage of a defense that has been better but still is one of the worst in the NFL. So I'm going to lean with the New York Giants, laying the three and a half. I don't feel great about it. I don't know how you really can, but ultimately I do think uh, that the Miami Dolphins will be a worthy adversary given how they play lately. Yeah, they play hard, and, and you got to give Byron Flores a lot of credit. That's been a tough team. They, for whatever talent he has, he gets them playing hard. 
Uh, the Giants, with Eli back, this might be his final home game. You never know. And, and that would be interesting to see how they respond to that. The other thing is, when you look at the Giants' defense, Janaris Jenkins tweeting during practice this week when he was during practice he's not there he's not practicing he's sending out tweets I mean there's a lot of disconnect. Is that worse than uh, Le'Veon Bell going bowling with the flu? No but yeah because it's during it? practice okay. and, and and Shermer is clearly out uh, I think that's going to be one of those situations. He's out he's after done. this season? Oh he's done. 7-22 and 22 overall. He's done he has to go and, and he knows he's going I think you could tell by his answers after the press conference but I think Eli Manning will I'm with you Brady I think Eli Manning will show up and play well in this game uh, and I think the Giants will find a way to win it. I mean, yeah, yeah I, I just don't think, look, Miami plays hard. They're just limited. Here's back-to-back -back games in the same stadium. How about well, that? If, if you look at the, what the issue was in the second half for the Giants versus Philly, it was, it was that pass rush. You know, obviously getting the ball out quick. Eli Manning was able to make his strikes to Slayton. That's not the same pass rush you have here with the Dolphins. If they want to get pressure, they have to bring pressure. Eli's smart enough and good enough, played enough football to be able to dissect that, get the ball out in the right spot. Might not have Devontae Parker in this game either, which would be a big Huge hit. loss. Yeah. A tenth consecutive loss would be the longest losing streak in Giants history. Both of you like the, the Giants minus yes, three yes. and a half. Yes, and, and a hot, lot of points in this game. A lot of a lot points. Of points. Okay. Picking every game in week 15. 425 Eastern time on Sunday. Eight and five Rams at six and seven Cowboys. If everything ended today, the six and seven Cowboys would host a playoff game. The eight and five Rams wouldn't be in the playoffs. I feel like everything's on the line for both these teams. I mean, this is a huge game in the context of but the playoffs. But it really playoffs. isn't for the Cowboys, though. Well, because you're making it so much about the division, but I also think you'd like to be able to build up some momentum, actually beat a good football team to go into that big matchup versus Philly. The Cowboys have yet to be able to do that this year. So it's big in, in that sense. And the fact that they're playing at home and the fact that they're not favored, it, it's a bit surprising. I mean, I don't know how else to put it at this point. They've got the roster. They've got the talent. It just it seems like maybe it's Jason Gear not helping to put it all together. And the Rams are playing some really good football blades. So... I kind of lean towards the Rams being able to go in there and get a win, but something tells me I think Dallas is going to bow up. They're going to find a way. This is a perfect example of one team writing itself because its coach is really good and the other one can't figure out what's going on because its coach is not very good. The, the Cowboys are a disaster because their coach is bad. They have talent on that team. Uh, they should be a better football team. They have no identity. Who are they? Uh, they don't run the ball when they need to run the ball. They throw it when they don't need to throw it. It's just no identity. And I, I'm but that has with, as much to do with Kellen Moore as it does Jason Gale. Well, he, he's the head coach. You're ultimately responsible for it, though. Sure, Brady. sure. But you also have got a guy who's calling plays for the first time in his career still trying to figure all those things out. And it, it's no different than talking about Jason Garrett letting Kellen Moore. Maybe he needs to take over and, and call plays instead. I don't know why he, he would go that direction if he knew everything was on the season this year. That's still a curiosity to me, but it's so different as Freddie Kitchens in Cleveland. I mean, again, it's still on him to figure it all out, but he's still trying to figure it out in that first year. It takes time to do that. But I, I think Kellen Moore, his youth, his inexperience has showed a little bit this year with some of those inconsistencies. But also, guys on the defensive side of the ball, Demarcus Lawrence hasn't improved. Jalen Smith. But that's, like, that's not Jason Garrett. That's it's not Mary it's on the, coach, it's on it's the coaching them. staff. Sure. And ultimately, he hires those guys. It's on him. This is the Cowboys coaching staff. The Rams on the other side have figured some things out. I think they're playing really well on offense. Jarek Goff has played well on offense lately. And who do you got in this game? The Los Angeles Rams. I'll go ahead. I'll take the one point. I got the Cowboys. Game doesn't matter to the home. Cowboys. It doesn't matter. It, 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 the, every game You're matters. saying that's that because if they beat the Eagles and then win... Week against the Redskins in Week the 17, Redskins, they're in anyway. They're in no matter what. They're in no matter what. So it's, essentially, this is an exhibition. But what? So if, I'm, okay. I'm sure Dallas would just like to roll over at home and not win. I'm sure Jason Garrett's preaching that no, to the team I mean, right now. Look, call. It, there's always a chance the Eagles could lose this week, and then that brings in some other factors. But if the Eagles win this week, all the Cowboys have to do is beat the Eagles and win in the final week of the season against the Reds. The scary thing for the Cowboys is we just saw Jared Goff's stats. As they've gotten healthier out on the outside, you've all of a sudden seen this offense really start to emerge. You've seen Todd Gurley start to play better. Even their offensive line looks like they're playing better. So all those things kind of mixed into one is what they're going to have to present this Dallas Cowboys defense. And look, you're right. I mean, the, the Rams are coming in as the better team, but I think Dallas at home, when they play their best football, and I do know that there's a sense of urgency there and they need to start playing their best football, regardless of what you think the implications on this game are, I think Dallas will end up getting a win. Okay. I'm on the other side. Gurley, back-to-back -back games with 100-plus yards from scrimmage. It's taken a while, but he's finally well, off using, the ground this season. They're, they're using, using him more, and again, it has to do, too, with taking some pressure off of him with what they're doing. And I think it's, it's their passing game when they've gotten healthier. Sometimes you're throwing to set up the run with him at this point. 
and I think they've gotten better as the year has gone on as they've gotten healthier. You guys are disagreeing on this game. Pete likes the Rams minus one. Brady likes the Cowboys plus one at home and to win. Okay, moving on to the 4-9 Falcons at the 11-2 49ers. San Francisco right now holding the top seed in the NFC after that incredible victory at the Superdome last week. Yeah, you wonder if this could be a potential trap game for them. Sandwich you know? game. Um, or sandwich game, as no one but Pete likes to point out. I guess Me. now, too. Uh, you wonder if you're, you're the sandwich. Yeah, you right wonder if that's a little bit of a concern. <laughs> uh, but Richburg, the center, is going to be out. And, right. and that's, that's a concern moving forward, I think, for the 49ers and for uh, Jimmy Garoppolo and you know, even the rushing attack. I mean, we saw how uh, New England Patriots now with the third string center, how that's impacted their pass protection, their running game, and everything else this year. So, uh, you know, as far as this matchup goes, I think San Francisco will be able to take care uh, of the Atlanta Falcons on the road with that front, with their defense. Maybe a little bit of a concern, though, you know, will Richard Sherman play or not? Uh, probably would think he'd be out for this one. Uh, wouldn't want to come back too soon and then jeopardize how he's going to be in the playoffs. But uh, this one could be close. This is one of those games where I kind of feel like that 10.5 points looks like a lot for the Falcons. I, I take the Falcons to the points, but I do think the 49ers win the game. The best thing to happen to the 49ers last week wasn't necessarily winning the game, although that's always a great thing. It was seeing Jimmy Garoppolo play the way he did in that moment, and he had to. He was fantastic. It was his best game by far. He looked like a Super Bowl winning quarterback and a guy who would get that team there, uh, and they needed to see that. I needed to see that. I wanted to see that. Pete needed to see that. And, and it's always about me. You know how that goes. And, and I give him props. And, and I, they can, we know they can run the ball, Brady. They can always run the ball. But he had to play in a game where he had to throw it around. I think that's the best thing for the 49ers. And it's why they're a legitimate, now legitimate Super Bowl team. I thought they were, but now I really believe We it. knew about Kittle. But Debo Samuel, the way he's come on this year, he's really, they've really got this kind of three-headed monster between the rushing attack and just the running backs in general, that you know, group by committee, Kittle and Debo Samuel. Now they've got all these pieces, and then they can mix in some other guys too from time to time. Defense but was bad though last week. It, well, it was bad, but also you realize you know what they're going up against. Michael Thomas is the best wide receiver in the NFL. Yeah, that, that, that's that's what's where, where and I'm they at. gimmicked up some stuff again. Sure, too, and Taysom Hill came in there. Yeah. He got some stuff done too. I know I you hate that. that I love that. Take yeah. take the ball out of Drew Brees. Like, hand. Clearly, it's effective. It's brilliant. Take the ball out of Drew Brees' hand. It's brilliant. <laughs> Brady thinks the Falcons are going to be able to stay inside that 10 points. Pete? I think the Falcons will hang inside the 10, too. I okay. think Matt Ryan will score some points against them, particularly if Richard Sherman's not in the lineup. Yeah. Okay, there's a, a handful of games at 4.05 Eastern on CBS. This is one of them. The 9-4 and four Vikings, the 5-8 and eight Chargers, who are feeling a little bit better about themselves. Phillip Rivers talking some more trash last week. Uh, getting Love it. Some nice TD passes. And the Vikings, they, they need it. They got the Rams right on their heels. This game's at 4.05 Eastern, Pete? Yeah. Is it a big game? No. So is Kirk Cousins going to play well? Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> the Chargers have actually been pretty good at home, uh, even though there's not much of a home field advantage. Uh, obviously, Phillip Rivers is playing better, too, but you can't take too much away from the Jacksonville victory. I mean, Jacksonville's been pretty bad. They're terrible. This one worries me. I, I like the Vikings in this spot. I think they obviously still have a lot out in front of them. The Chargers aren't playing for anything at this point. But still, something tells me this is going to be a tough game. It's going to be tough for the Minnesota offensive line. They're going to get pressure on Cousins. We're going to shut down Dalvin Cook, but I'm going to go with the Vikings, and I'll lay the two and a half points. Well, there'll be a lot of Vikings fans in that, in that crowd. I bet there of will. course, yeah. yeah they'll have any excuse to go to warm weather right yeah, now. they'll travel, and, and uh, there'll be a lot of Vikings fans there, but uh, I like the Chargers in this game. I, I think they seem to find something it. offensively, and granted, Jacksonville's defense is awful, but they were good last week, throwing the football, dinking and dunking, getting the ball out. Eckler was fantastic, and defensively, I think that's going to be a problem here. I think those pass rushers are going to get all over uh, Kirk Cousins in this game, force a few turnovers. I like the Chargers in this one. To your point, that Minnesota secondary just hasn't been the same. No. And, and I think that's where Phillip Rivers can kind of look at having a little bit of his heyday versus that group. All that being said, I still think the Vikings are the better team. So I think the Vikings are the better Vikings. team, too, but I think in this spot, I think the Chargers are going to win the game. All right, I disagree. So you're yeah. entitled to your wrong opinion? I am. Oh, I like if, that. That's good if line. the Vikings lose that game, they could be in some trouble because if the Rams get a victory over the Cowboys, then those two teams would be tied for the last playoffs. And that's why it's interesting because Pete likes to use that desperation. They need this one. They've got to get this. But he's not using it in this case then for the Minnesota Vikings. Peeking ahead to the Packers. Pete's just looking ahead. I mean, he's got I always, the Cowboys hey, looking always ahead to the look. Eagles. You always got to look at the big picture. It's yeah. not like these guys say week to week. It's big it picture. It 100% is week to week. No, it's not. It is. Big picture. <laughs> <laughs> you choked me up, Pete. <laughs> All right, also, 405 Eastern on CBS, 4-9 and nine Jaguars. 
coached by Pete Prisco, and the 6-7 and seven Raiders who have looked as bad as any team in the NFL, maybe outside of Jacksonville the last three weeks. If I coached them, they wouldn't be 4-9. Don't, oh, don't insult me like that. 0-13. Oh, no. If I was a GM, they wouldn't be 4-9. I'll say that. I wouldn't have taken Leonard Fournette fourth overall with Mahomes and Watson on the board. But that's all he's actually having the, the best season of his career. He's and, been very good. And, and this, is, this season's not on him. He's played phenomenal. Uh, I will be so curious. running back fourth overall when you had Mahomes and Watson on the board. That's enough said. Well, they, they've made a number of mistakes. I mean, you can go back and talk about, obviously, at that point, they were still investing in Blake Bortles. So right. We don't yeah. need to get into that. They're, they're, they're <laughs> still trying to figure out the quarterback position right now. But Fournette's been one of the stable pieces they've had. They're going to have to rely on him in this matchup. I just don't see them having a ton of productivity, though, on the road versus Oakland. This, this Oakland defense isn't very good, but obviously this offensive line isn't very good. So I actually think this is a good spot for the Raiders uh, six and a half points. Something tells me that's a little bit big there, though, considering how both these two teams have played. But if Josh Jacobs is back in this game, and I do think he will be, I'll feel just fine landing. You know what was going on in Jacksonville this week? Hello, uh, you, my travel agent? Uh, yeah, book me a couple weeks in the Bahamas. Uh, and another guy call up. Give me a couple weeks in the Caymans. They're checked out. They're oh, done. Ready for the They're finished. There, aren't they? They're over. Marone's getting fired at the end of the season. The team is terrible. They've quit. They're awful. The Raiders will win this game. They will cover the number. And if Josh Jacobs plays, he goes for 200 easily. How about wow. that? Wow. I don't know if he's going to play, though. I think uh, between him and Washington, they'll get 200. How about that? Okay. That, that sounds more reasonable. It sounds... They always have trouble in Oakland. They always have trouble on the West Coast. And this is the last game ever in the Coliseum. That place is going to be mm. rocking. It will be rocking. That's a good point. Yeah. Um, a couple of notes. Raiders have been outscored 116-33 to 33 over the last three it's games. It's not good. Not and the good. Jaguars are the first team since 1986 to lose five straight by 17-plus. Do you know which team did that in 86? It was Lost five straight Tampa by Bay. 17 plus. It was Tampa Bay. The Tampa Bay Buccaneers. <laughs> Terrible the quarterback of that team. Steve Young? 86? No, it wasn't Steve Young. It's a bad somebody team, really bad. Vinny? Maybe. Might have been Might Vinny have been Testaverde. Vinny. Uh, moving on to the 6 and 7 Browns, who can't win 10 like games, years, but yeah. can win 9. At the 3 9 and 1 Arizona Cardinals, Kyler Murray hasn't played very well of late. No, he hasn't. And I think this could be a get back right spot. But Steve Wilkes is the defensive coordinator of the Cleveland Browns. This, this is he's got some inside you know notes about the personnel some inside intel it's different uh, though it's all different now it's it's some you no know, no about the personnel oh. not the scheme a lot of it's different too though well not that much different there's a good amount but not that much there's there's still a lot of guys that he was there with so i think that'll play a little bit of an advantage this one and, and say whatever you want about the cleveland browns and everything else that's going on on the outside they'll win this game they'll go into arizona especially the cardinals have been playing and win this football game uh, I do wonder how they're going to handle the Cardinals' pass rush because I think the Cleveland Browns' offensive line, they're not good enough. They have to worry about that every single week, but I think this is a good spot for Baker Mayfield. I do, too. Uh, I think they're going to go in there and score points. Look, the Cardinals' defense is terrible, uh, 500 yards a couple different times in the past month and a half, and, and I don't think Air, uh, Cleveland will get 500 yards, but they're going to be able to throw the football. They'll be able to run the football. Uh, and I'm concerned a little bit about where Kyler Murray and the offense is right now. We thought they had turned the corner about a, a three and a half weeks, four weeks ago, and playing really well. And we said, okay, here they are, Cliff Kingsbury, Murray, they're showing everybody. The last couple weeks, they haven't shown anything. You want to know what's happened? During that three-game win streak, Kyler Murray ran the football ten-plus times in each one of those games. He has got to be a part of the rushing attack. On that three-game winning streak, teams had to defend him. After that, he hasn't been quite as mobile. He hasn't threatened teams with his legs. When he does that... It changes what defenses present him with. He plays better. The team plays better. Kyler Murray's got to start running the football. Cliff Kingsbury's got to put the ball in his hands and let him be a playmaker. He runs backwards a lot because he takes 40, you know, two-step drops. It's ridiculous how deep his drops are sometimes. Yeah, I'm sure his offensive line loves that. <laughs> I bet they do. Who's Baker Mayfield throwing under the bus after the game? Uh, who's left at this point? Well, he's got to go after kitchen soon. That's coming. Oh, yeah? That's going to throw the kitchen sink? That's coming. That's coming. They're going to win this game. Water. He's not going to throw anyone They'll under win the bus. The, they will win this game. No, they game. won last week, and he threw yeah. the training staff under the bus. That's a good point. They'll win, they'll win this game, though. That would be five wins in six games. Is Kitchens going to survive this no. if they continue to win? No. I mean, they very well can have a 9-7. They could. The schedule has been a joke. Let's be honest about it. Okay. It's been a joke. But they end up a 9-7. and seven. That's an improvement upon last year. It's a winning record. You really can get rid of them? Is that 10? No. It's not 10. It's, it's one off of it, though. It's not. But it's, it's not 10. It's a lot closer than what you predicted. Which one was that? You predicted six wins for them this year. Yeah, I did. <laughs> they still might have six wins. No. They're going to pass that. <laughs> By the way, the Bucks quarterback in 86 was Steve Young. It was Steve Young. It was Steve Young. Wow. Good for you. And I'm sure people like you 
on the radio back in the day or in the newspaper were saying, who's this bum Steve Young? Get him out of here. Move on from him. He's terrible. No, you know what I was probably saying? He runs too much. And you know what? He stopped running. He won Super Bowl. He still, still ran a fair amount Not as San Francisco. Not as much. Look he at his numbers. As, as his numbers came down to running numbers, his passing we numbers were way up. We have a Steve Young graphic to put behind us. He became a much better quarterback. quarterback. In the prime time games on Sunday night and Monday night with Pete Prisco and Brady Quinn. I'm Chris Hassel. We've got Sunday Night Football, 9-4 and four Bills at 8-5 and five Steelers. Those are the two wild card teams right now. You know, I was wrong last week. You know, I, well, I picked, you the, said Buffalo it. Bills, did say picked it. the Buffalo Bills, and someone else followed suit with me. Yeah, he really talked me into that one because I liked Baltimore, but I thought Buffalo at home would be you able to did, hold court. You were on the fence on that yeah, one, but, and you but came but this is mind. a spot where I'm yeah. still going to trust in Buffalo on the road, putting together enough of a performance. Even though Pittsburgh's favored, I'll take the two and a half points. I think they do enough defensively. Josh Allen does enough to be able to win this football game. My only concern is that wide receiver group, if they can't separate, if they can't get open versus the, the Pittsburgh secondary, that's been really good this year, especially since the addition of Mika Fitzpatrick. Uh, that concerns me moving forward. I know the weather played an issue last week, could this week, uh, but I, I think Buffalo finds a way to get it done. So did the Baltimore Blitz. They came after him in every form and fashion, and they couldn't handle it, and he didn't handle it well, and the receivers didn't handle it well. Uh, but do the Steelers go after him? Uh, that's that's the question for me. They don't they, have to because no. they can generate edge pressure you would with think, Watt. You would Dupree. think. Uh, but, uh, you know, Allen needs some help. Uh, those receivers got to catch the ball. Uh, the running game needs to get going. I thought there were some spurts in that game where Singletary actually looked good. He, he's another guy that needs to run the football. I agree. He has to be part of the rushing attack. And, and he had that one little drive where they scored, and he looked good in that drive. Uh, defensively, they were outstanding. Uh, entirely different animal here, different type of defense, offense you're going to face. But can they limit what Hodges does in the passing game? And I think they can. I, I don't. They're going to get Juju Smith-Schuster back too in Pittsburgh. Yeah, I still think that the Bills are the, are the better team. I think their defense will be the better defense in this game as well as the Steelers have played. And I think Josh Allen, like he did on Thanksgiving when he went to Dallas, will show up in prime time. The Bills haven't been on in prime time, I don't think, since on Sunday night since like 1990-something. Isn't that what they said? It, it's ridiculous when the last time they were on. Her cousin should night. play for that team. He'd be He'd unbeatable. be the greatest quarterback in the Never world if he play played on that time. team. But I think Josh Allen will play well here. I like the Bills to win the game. I'm with you. I'll, I'll take the two and a half points. I, I could see a, a formula for Pittsburgh winning this one, but I think Buffalo – you know, gets back in and into the good graces of the playoff. Who's winning the game? Court. I have got Buffalo. Okay. Right. Well, you yeah. were like you were like, I could see Pittsburgh winning. You were hedging again. I wasn't hedging. I, then I, you go back next I, week. I, you say, I was wrong. I last talked week. you into Buffalo. Who, who, who did, uh, I was wrong last week. Wow. I admit I was That's wrong. First. Oh. Yeah, I can all I know. I and about old. Steve Young apparently? No, too? not about but, Steve Young. Oh you weren't, okay. No. Jeez. All right, Pete. Uh, so you guys both like the Bills to cover. Pete likes them to win. Yep. Outright. Plus two and a half. All right, Monday night football, six and seven Colts. Pretty much out of the playoff race at this point at the 10-3 and three Saints who are trying to uh, get a bye in the first round of the NFC playoffs. He's got major concerns, though. He's worried about that He defense. is really worried about the this Saints This is kind defense. of that get back on track game, though, for the Saints defense then. They're not going to have T.Y. Hilton. He's out still with that calf injury. Jacoby Brissett hasn't played quite as well. I think this is a get back on track game for the Saints. They'll put up a bunch of points uh, versus that defense. Their secondary has been a little bit banged up. Uh, and I think their defense starts to kind of right the ship, figure it out as they head into the Over playoffs. under is only 45 and a hook. That seems low to me. But And and back-to-back -back road games for the Colts outside the division. Tough place to play. You mentioned the defense. No Davenport now. No Rankins. That front has been decimated by injuries. They're going to have problems generating a pass rush. Uh, but even having said all that, I think the, the Saints will find a way offensively to score points uh, and win this game. But again, moving forward. I am concerned about that Saints defense. Pete's Pete's concerned. concerned. You're not? Pete's concerned. You're not? Well, we'll see what they do this week. If they allow the Colts to hang around in this one or downright allow another home loss in back-to-back -back weeks, now I'm concerned. I don't foresee that happening, though. I think the Saints will take care of business, and I'll lay the eight and a half points. They're not going to be peeking ahead to Ryan Tannehill next week, are they? No. No, I don't think so either. Put the season <laughs> for Michael Thomas into perspective, Brady. Record-breaking. I mean, that, that, that's where he's, he's, he's headed towards. And, and you just have to look at last week, second half, first half, slow start, second half, really closed out. To me, he was one of the reasons why he, they even hung around in that game. Uh, I can't get over just his catch percentage. If you look at how many times he's targeted, how many times he's catching the football, it, it's absurd. And he's really the only option. Right. It's not like they have anything on the other side. And, and, and look, and then the other thing about last week was Jared Cook, who after like a couple catches, what he had, 60 yards, touchdowns, he left the game. Right. And so, like, really then at that point, all the 49ers had to do was focus on Michael Thomas. They still couldn't stop him in the second half. So, I, I'm just, year after year since he's been in the league, and even more so this year, 
because even the rushing attack isn't quite as good. I mean, if, if you're saying that you need to focus on one thing right now, it is Michael Thomas. That's the only thing you got to focus on outside of the wild card that is Taysom Hill when he comes in. And teams still can't stop him. So it's, it, it's been a phenomenal year. The only him. negative on him is the touchdowns. It's seven. Should be, that should be about 12. Because, again, Taysom Hill comes in. That's a part of it. Camara, Murray, there's other should targets. should be about 12, 11, 12. All right, here we go. I'm, you guys I'm both like uh, New Orleans to cover the eight and a half? I like New Orleans. I'll lay the eight and a half. I'll lay the eight and a half as well. Okay. Uh, there's another show on another network where some guy comes on at the end of the show and they correct errors that the hosts make. Well, there was an error that Pete made earlier in the show about Steve Young. Right. He said that, uh, you know, Steve Young got better when he stopped running the football. Well, when he won the Super Bowl in 1994, he led the 49ers in rushing. Wow. The right. And two years team. later, he threw 35 touchdown passes, which was the most in his career when he stopped running and he was down to 200. Well, so you're times. saying Young he became got a better, better quarterback. in the late 90s? He became a better quarterback when he stopped We were talking running. about 1986 when he was playing with the Buccaneers. He was a disaster you know, Eight years later, he's still running the football. In 86, he was a disaster. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Eat my popcorn. Bucks were Eat my popcorn and watch this. <laughs> yeah. All right, hey, I, I we're out of here. Uh, Amanda Garrett is in with Brady as we talk college football. Now.